obviously I'm very grateful to you uh, for speaking to us. As you know, um, uh, we are really looking at the way, we, we come from an aerospace and defense background, a lot of us, at um, my company. So we are looking at ways in which aerospace and defense sector intervention can um, uh, really sort of act on global challenges as we come out of the pandemic. But of course, we've also seen how they've, those same, those same technology uh, solution uh, areas are impacting positively on the pandemic as well. So I, I wondered, you know, with your former uh, UN hat on as Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Emergency Relief Coordination, um, whether you, uh, you know, looking at the whole um, field of global challenges, uh, what opportunities you felt there were for more industry engagement in the global challenges space? Well, I think we can certainly take a clue from what has happened pre-coronavirus, uh, uh, where we were at. And in particular, in the humanitarian space, as against pure development and partnership, in the humanitarian space, which ultimately is about saving life from either natural disaster or man-made disaster, such as conflict, and protecting vulnerable people, including trying to prevent women's bodies being used as weapons of war, the children and uh, elderly and the chronically ill finding themselves marginalised and vulnerable, uh, either, in terms, either in terms of natural disasters or uh, man-made conflict. The real crunch is that whatever the numbers are, and they move a little bit about, but broadly speaking, about 150 million people in the world tonight need their lives saving. And that is broadly spread about uh, 40 countries, and it's uh, coordinated by the UN to respond to disaster uh, through the office I used to lead, the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. For that response to be effective, there is an estimate made each year as to how much it would cost to be able to reach people to achieve true life-saving and sustainable outcomes and as a result of the World Humanitarian Summit in Istanbul back in May uh, 2016 uh, it became clear that the objective of all humanitarian action which I have to say has been brilliantly exemplified by the International Committee of the Red Cross over many many decades uh, including their wider responsibilities for reunification of families the protection of prisoners and conditions and so forth but it was very much to say that our objective has to be to coordinate the available resources and political will around the world in order to help people survive and thrive. And there was a real demand to move to straddling the humanitarian development divide, which has bedeviled this response over many times. Because when you have a natural disaster, it's, it's easy to imagine. Imagine that you go in and whether it's an earthquake or a tsunami or whatever, you can relieve the pressure uh, and you can make the response and it's episodic. You then find yourself leaving and very often you don't necessarily leave a, a legacy upon which local agencies can then thrive uh, to help boost the opportunities of people and to build resilience going forward. That is where the non-public sector, the outside industries, can really make a big difference. And it's in that transition. Having said all that, the real challenge and the context for our total discussion is that when the coordination of humanitarian affairs and the emergency response was sort of set up about 27, 28 years ago as very much as of Johnny come lately within the overall UN architecture, uh, straddle between New York and Geneva, but with people in many, many countries, and coordinating the UN agencies such as the Refugees, the um, uh, uh, International Office for Migration, World Food Program. Uh, it, it's very important to recognize how, unfortunately, at that time, 
uh, which probably required about four billion pounds uh, dollars of uh, public funding, all of it voluntary, none of it is, uh, is, is secured by any allocations or, as it were, fee at the UN, so you have to go out and raise it every year. Uh, but the real problem is now it's, you need about $25 billion. And that is um, still very tough to raise, as you can imagine. It, it never gets raised to that degree every year. So some, somewhere somebody is suffering, which is terrible because um, specific trade-offs aren't made. I mean, it's just a question of whether you can get the funding. But the real issue is between 80 and 90% at any one time of human need to protect from suffering or for sheer protection is from slow onset deliberate man-made conflict which then takes decades to resolve you only have to look at places like the Dadaab camp and so forth in northeast Kenya so the reason for saying all that is that it is far far more difficult whether you're in charge of the international agency which is coordinating such as I was or if you're part of the many NGOs around who are part of the broad extension resource that goes into uh, relieve suffering, it is very hard for the private sector to be involved and very hard for the military, especially if they're in uniform, to be part of a response to 90% of the demand. So that is the problem because you can't put uniformed people into conflict situations. And if you're the chief executive of a company, you don't want to put your own people at risk. So you then are reliant upon what can they offer in terms of design process and so, and so often unfortunately the public sector the UN or uh, NGOs have tended to look at the industries that make up uh, the defense architecture have tended to look at them as not potential sources of expertise time process and so forth they've tended to look at them as um, ATMs and of course that tends to push them away. So the, the structural issue is that we are dealing mainly with how do you, you intervene and to be partners in effective outcomes where the context is long, unresolved, very nasty conflict. Because in the natural disaster side, the response actually, if the world is being fair to itself, is pretty good. And whilst we never want anybody to die, and whilst it's always too slow compared to what you would wish, actually it's very speedy. You'll often see some of these naval ships, or you'll see uh, aircraft, and you've got all sorts of uh, design and product uh, results that are used very happily um, in many agencies, whether it's um, aircraft and so forth in the World Food Programme. Uh, and we have good partnerships with uh, people like um, UPS or DHL to help with transportation and logistics. So all those are in place but they do tend to be very focused on natural disasters so that is the context for this discussion is where can we make an additive change going forward that enables participation for the greatest part of the need and demand which is in very brutal man-made conflict uh, that, that having been said, are you able to separate out some of the causes of conflict? I mean, apart from if you take the human dimension out, which is, of course, the most uh, potent um, cause of conflict. But there are some underlying causes of conflict, which also give us cause for concern. And of course, the sort of big daddy of them all is climate change. So I wondered whether you're able to sort of separate out those um, in, in terms of causes of conflict and take them individually as uh, global challenges you can target that help to ameliorate or alleviate the conflict issue? I mean, yes and no. You can separate out insofar as you can, you can identify um, the underlying causes. So if you get resource scarcity or very rapidly changing contextual expectations as to what can be harvested, what can be reaped from the, from the natural world in order to sustain populations and therefore to give people that sense of survivability and above all hope. Um, and what can underpin that? So, you know, the technology within various industries about making sure that you can uh, find um, uh, uh, adaptations to uh, rice so that it can actually survive underwater, what we call um, 
uh, scuba rice. Uh, that has been very important when we got the last El Nino effect going through the Mekong Delta and uh, so many of the rice paddy fields went underwater for sustained periods of time. So you can see how that climate change interface between the resource scarcity, human populations and technology and the business drivers of that can interface. When it comes to uh, the, the, the sort of aerospace and defense uh, sectors, um, of course, there is very often uh, an enormous amount of, of data and uh, data manipulation and capture that is at the heart of aerospace and and defense. Uh, that, of course, in terms of why governments procure those uh, specialities and products is for their defense and um, sadly at times for aggression. But, um, of course, the techniques that lie behind that very often put into a, a civil, into a, into a peaceful uh, purpose uh, are just as powerful, just as important. The real problem then comes about access to both the way that the public sector, whether it's the UN or indeed uh, NGOs and others, procure, both in terms of making sure there's a proper procurement process that is going to stand the rigors of audit and traceability for public money, but secondly, uh, uh, making sure that the respect for confidentiality and the necessary distance between competitors is maintained. And that is difficult because very often it's industry itself which finds it very difficult to trust the public sector not to breach some of their commercial confidentiality. And that often arises very early in the process of discussion before the public side of the discussion feels comfortable. They've seen the range of what's on offer and want to trade things off between various offers and are used to, unfortunately, quite a number of people peddling snake oil and trying to get a good public contract out of it. So there is, a, there is an inherent built distrust between the two. Whereas one is using public money where they expect to be thoroughly audited in two or three years' time and their jobs absolutely held to account as to whether they wasted or got very best value for money out of public taxpayer funding, whether it's remote or direct. And industry, which of course is looking to make sure it has a good sale into um, uh, into a good purpose and, and no doubt a highly moral purpose, but at the same time can cover its costs and earn a return, not least because very often this is based upon some uh, research, may even be patented, it will certainly be know-how, which they will want to make sure that they can protect going forward. And that is that is again one of the contextual problems that has been a traditional barrier to this interface really working in a very productive and an imaginative way where you get a lot of the leverage that you could get from particularly the aerospace and defense sector which carries with it anyway a certain edginess because um, some not all some NGOs and some again not all public sector bodies be they national or multilateral to have a, an inherent distrust of anything which could support uh, war, conflict, and and the suspension of what they would see as the complete play of human rights. So that I do um, uh, understand. So in order, in order to overcome this, uh, and I've seen this on display very often um, if you go to some of these big exhibitions for humanitarian solutions, some of the aerospace and defense companies will be very well represented because they can see how their technologies, how their products, how their processes how their underpinning ability to use the new data world we all live in can really help marshal in a very efficient way, uh, a way of getting better access in a sustained way to people who need the support. Well, that's very interesting because that touches on two issues that we've found have acted or either as barriers or as potential barriers to deepen aerospace and defense sector involvement and engagement in this space. One of them you clearly touched on, which is there is understandable antipathy on the part of some NGOs uh, about dealing with aerospace and defense companies, which they see as being somehow part of the problem in, in the conflict arena, uh, in that you know, sometimes unscrupulous um, 
uh, and, and this of course it, it implicates governments as much as it does aerospace and defense but unscrupulous export policies to tinderbox regions of conflict uh, it, you know is a, is a source of great upset and aggravation point one um, the second barrier to their deepening uh, involvement in the uh, global challenges space as we see it is that there is a, uh, a clear procurement system that pulls through aerospace and defense sector technology in their traditional customer base, governments and defense ministries to wit. Um, I don't see that procurement organization, and you've touched on this already too, I don't see that procurement organization being nearly so robust or uh, uh, methodical um, in the NGO space. So Pat, Pat, can we talk a little bit to a little bit more to that whole area of challenge? Well, certainly, um, uh, let me take the easier one first, which I think is the question about distrust. Uh, there are some uh, public bodies and there are certainly uh, a number of NGOs, particularly in the international NGO field, who are very conscious that um, whether you're a public body or a, an NGO, you have to derive all your money voluntarily from people who wish to give it to you. So what drives that resource uh, comes from the motivations of those who wish to give it willingly. So at a public body level, it's effectively taxpayer funded. And so that is through the refraction of politics and governments and the way they are accountable to their various populations and the way tax is raised and then allocated and so you can see even outside the military sphere of interaction with humanitarian and even development uh, access um, you can see how even in an extraordinarily generous and benign country such as the united kingdom it, it remains a permanent ongoing debate as to how much of our hard-won taxpayers' money, those in government, the politicians, those in the House of Commons, whether it's one party in government or right across the House in terms of a combined approach, how much the, the allocation to spending money on people in other countries for humanitarian and development purposes, for climate change mitigation and adaptations, uh, for broad, collective, multilateral, it remains always controversial because people have a deep distrust that that is money being used well. And that is where, if you like, DFID has managed to establish a very high reputation because it is so specialist at what it does. But that has naturally led to now a current debate whether or not that should be, as it were, subsumed within the broad Foreign and Commonwealth Office political direction so that you get more soft power returns out of that than currently is gained because it's done on such an objective basis, as we know. So the issue on that, it seems to me, is driven as much, uh, of course, the dialogue with government will always be there. But the issue is really the, the touchstone on this is the dialogue you have with NGOs. The traditional way of that, a set such as aerospace defense with say a, a body like bond the united kingdom um, the challenge there is it will come to the agreement of the lowest common denominator because the charity represented even within bond that is least happy about any connection with any industry which could possibly uh, have a connection with conflict uh, as a potential dual use if you like or uh, is, I mean, there are some who are totally uh, allergic to the very word, let alone the notion of profit. Uh, and, and if you have that, you have got a challenge. So it, it's my view that uh, the, to make progress in this direction, which I think is happening in a number of ways already, it has been for a while, is rather than do it collective to collective, is that I think one has to pick out those NGOs who have a a more broadly based approach and to identify those as to with whom they can become exemplar partners uh, and to become collaborators in a sort of joint venture of activity. 
that can then produce an extraordinary offering that's going to clearly outcompete those who are choosing not to take that view. And I think that will be the way to lead rather than to only go at the pace of the slurst. So I think the dialogue is not collective. I think the dialogue has to be targeted according to those who've got the most appetite. That's very interesting. And, and in your experience, have you come across, do you, do you believe those NGOs exist? Are they out there? Are there some with a mind to, 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 to have that dialogue? Yes, absolutely. And it's very interesting um, how so many of, of our very wonderfully trained and skilled and uh, uh, leading um, uh, forces personnel from uh, all parts of uh, the armed forces and i'm speaking specifically of the uk now because i've met it in my work uh, uh, from many many countries whether it's uh, from armies of the middle east or or the american army and so forth and the of course the americans have famously got the corps of engineers um it's very a lot of people even if they were trained as soldiers and have come out they are then very motivated to use those skills and that knowledge and that experience and that ability of teams for these purposes of either humanitarian or development additional response um, and and there are a number already in place who are either set them up or have been have joined existing uh, charities and it's very i think it's very helpful and very encouraging that that's taking place and i think those are the ones to focus on i think it would be somewhat invidious to name uh, charities but um I mean, there are certain ones who very much do not believe in that and I think they're easier to identify and it's best not to waste too much time going that, that route. Everybody should, you know, has their part to play and some will want to play in a different field. So those who are not willing to really uh, accommodate that breadth of uh, understanding I think may be the ones just to leave out of the picture at this stage. Uh, the other point you raised was on procurement and um, here it's it's genuinely more difficult because the procurement process um, that you're used to in the aerospace and defence sectors, primarily with governments, ministries of defence, uh, and, and occasionally uh, agents in between, um, and now widening because in the past it tends to be very product and uh, materiel driven about what can assist fighting soldiers, sea, uh, sea personnel and, uh, uh, and air personnel to, to prosecute towards a win of, of their military ambitions or in aerospace to make sure that they can simply uh, deliver exactly what they want to do in the civil world of uh, normally uh, making sure you can get from A to B in the most effective way possible. Um, the real challenge is now this is extended so much into cyber and into some cross-sectoral working, which is deeply sectoral for the aerospace defense industry, but at the same time has total application elsewhere. And so it's much more, uh, it's getting more complicated. I think the procurement process, even the old traditional way between that sector and, and governments, but it's always been extremely difficult when you are the public body not of a government, but of a multilateral, such as the UN, such as in the past, the EU, were no longer applicable to the UK, but certainly applicable to still a huge purchasing power of the world. And, um, and particularly when you're looking at uh, some of the partners in uh, places around the world. So you know, whilst it's easy to perhaps target in the, the continent of Africa, you've got 54, 55 very different countries all operating in different ways, and you have to tell your approach and you're going to have a collective approach but it is very very different and very difficult to uh to negotiate with countries which haven't got the same democratic accountabilities that we have in the background be that russia or china or other big purchases so the procurement process at something like the un is one where basically we can often see the need but then you have to go out and raise money or at least raise promises that if you were to go out and procure something to fix this issue, that the money would then flow from those countries, would come into the UN pot, with the UN then to procure whatever it wished to procure. Well, you can imagine a huge amounts of influence are brought to bear because the UN is in the end run by its states. And states, if they're going to give a lot of money, are quite keen that that money should be used to buy their products if they possibly can, whilst at the same time having to be completely open and transparent about what they would regard as a fair and just procurement process, which is objective. 
that is difficult because um, huge amounts of money are, are at stake. Um, and, and if you don't get the volunteer money that starts it out, then you're not going to get the procurement. So there is a subliminal sort of link, which um, you know, has to be worked out very hard. And, and this can be for uh, things as, as innocent as, I don't know, sewage systems. Um, you know, we're not talking about sort of aggressive things, but you know, just basic procurement, but, or traffic light systems or anything, which you know, are part of what the UN is doing to try and save you know, masses of road deaths in certain capitals of the world, you need traffic lights. Well, they will be procured and they'll be part of what the UN helps to procure for a particular country. That process has got to be done objectively, but it takes two, three years. Uh, prices have to be held for that period of time. There are internal variations. Um, very often variations are the way companies make profits, um, but that's not allowed within the UN process. So these are very antipathetic to a business in, in dialogue. So the procurement process in question is a barrier because it's quite a high risk for a business. Well, I feel sort of we're getting towards the nub of the issue. Uh, and, and certainly for me, as I try to under, understand this, uh, this very complex space, we have an opportunity, as you've said, for bilateral engagement with certain, with certain NGOs. But as global challenges are, as their um, very name uh, tells them, global, it, it, it doesn't appear that there is a global procurement infrastructure for uh, um, putting together solutions on the scale that they're needed to address, address them. And we sort of know what they are because we see the 17 SDGs, the, the UN 17 SDGs, and they are big, complex global challenges. We have organizations, sub-organizations like the UN's Global Compact for bringing industry involvement to bear on these, these things, but it still seems to me there is a gap in the way that big solutions can be procured and uh, engage, you know, brought to engage upon um, large uh, global challenges. Would you say that's a fair assessment? Yes, I think broadly, yes. Um, it, goes to a, it goes to a deeper issue. And having been both uh, in charge of a large multilateral UN uh, department, as well as previously a government minister and a politician, but in, in my case, as it happens in the industries before that, I am conscious that what we do in our own lives, what industry does in its life, which is to try and be supremely good at whatever it does and to ensure against catastrophic risk. The one thing that is so is that the trade-off between, and this is, I'm particularly, I suppose, talking about um, the democratic settlement. So this would not necessarily apply in authoritarian uh, countries. Um, and certainly it's one of the issues we face in pure security terms when it comes to those who are now not seeing boundaries as any kind of constraint um, and uh, just being able to not rely upon the sort of tax paying ju jurisdiction the economic underpinning of societies and democratic accountabilities but for the majority where most of the money is coming from which is still uh, democratic uh, states the real issue is that the trade-off between people being prepared to allow through elections, governments to be elected to take decisions on their behalf, is that, and then of course tax them, is that they're not that keen, nobody likes paying tax, but you, we recognize it as a, a proper trade-off, and they want to see that money spent well, but they don't like the governments hoarding money. They don't like insurance. Uh, and insurance, you know, does have to concentrate on catastrophe. Uh, so often you have um, a, a, an approach to sort of almost swapping dollars in insurance. And you don't, that, that's the wrong way around. I mean, you need to concentrate your premium on what is catastrophic. Now, clearly we are faced with a catastrophe, potentially, in climate change. 
for the planet. We are faced with a humanitarian catastrophe in terms of too many people, innocent civilians, dying because of privation from the terrible calumnies of uh, global conflict uh, and the various wars that are taking place and very often within states where the UN has to take a step back under its charter because it can't interfere in the internal affairs of a state but where it's then hijacked by proxies we really have to look at Russia's support of Syria or Saudi Arabia in Yemen and these are obvious proxies where again they say well don't interfere in the internal affairs of the states and the Security Council at that point becomes completely impotent and so um, you, you, on the things which are not really conflict driven you can take steps so on climate change and the El Nino effect that we had back in 2016 uh, I remember I appointed um, Mary Robinson, the former president of Ireland, and the uh, UN uh, permanent representative for Kenya, uh, Mr. Macau, and together they produced a blueprint as to what we, steps we should take in advance. I remember there being an, an extraordinarily challenging moment at the UN in January 17, just in the first few weeks of the current Secretary General's uh, term. And I got information which showed that simultaneously we were at one step away from very catastrophic famine level five under the few step measure of famine in yemen somalia south sudan and northeast nigeria all at the same time and we had a press conference down in the basement of the un building on the east river in new york and i remember saying you know we need to avert these famines that means i need the money now to put the steps in place so already the damn animals are all dead you know next step humans let's stop it to which, of course, that was quite a challenge. And I remember the press pack saying, well, this is extraordinary. Why are you doing this? And I said, well, surely it is better that we get the money to stop people dying rather than waiting for people to be in famine when we can prove it over screens like this and then the money will come. But it's too late at that point. You've not averted the famine. It was something we could do. So insurance or putting money in place ready for something which may or may not is not the culture of the way taxpayers want their democracies to raise and use their money. They prefer to know a proven fact. And we are going through this to some degree, even now as we speak, with the coronavirus, the COVID-19, whether it's in the UK or elsewhere, because you know, the idea of completely tooling up in advance, in warehouses and in hospital capacity for a pandemic, which may or may, never happen, may not ever happen, that is too difficult for that expenditure to have been put out there at the expense of current needs and current accountabilities. So I think there is a real, where well, the procurement process is a, a reflection of an absence of sufficient trust between ultimately the taxpaying public and their, de and their democratic elected politicians and governments to basically put hordes of money or material in place for an event that may not happen. But my view is that we have to find a way of introducing a dialogue and a discussion which enables us to at least put in place preparedness against catastrophe and on the wider piece that would then lead to global climate change and that means huge expenditure now in addition to the current expenditures to try and move us in a mitigating and adapting way away from fossil fuels to uh, natural fuels so those are my observations from the difficulty of marrying the political will which drives everything and the resource to be available at the moment you need it in order to avert catastrophe either we human life or the planet upon which we survive and do you think stephen that given um what is happening with the coronavirus pandemic there is now more or less of an appetite to engage or look to these other global challenges and, and of course you know climate change probably being the largest of them all but we all know what the others are uh, and uh and having an appetite for tackling those as we come out of pandemic given that we've seen what pandemic can do to us all um, and and the fact that it is global it, it is it is literally uh, uh you know it, it embraced the entire world so do you see an appetite amongst countries now coming out of this, or when we do come out of it, for more global challenge engagement, or are we going to uh, bury our heads in the sand? 
Uh, it's too early to tell. Um, I think that it's more likely than not that we will continue to adhere, I would say, thankfully, to uh, identity as nations behind borders, which uh, uh, define our jurisdiction, define sometimes our identity, uh, define our economic opportunities, define our, define our enterprise, uh, as well as our social and um, familial uh, sense of security. Uh, uh, and within that, where we derive our ambition and a sense of moral compass that uh, makes us a civilized and decent nation that will always put in safety nets for those who are least advantaged. So that, I imagine, will continue, although there are some discussions now being exaggerated. Uh, the collapse of the Westphalian solution and that we are becoming more and more borderless. It could be easily misinterpreted that Brexit is actually a sign of that. I, I, I don't think so. I think that's an irrelevance. I think it's more to do with how difficult it is to have a world order and indeed the very serious uh, actions that took place of the arrival and growth of ISIS cross borders, try and uh, make sure that those who were antipathetic towards other people's ability to survive on this planet, because they just didn't like it, and had a belief that they wanted to uh, impose their will, you know, that had to be stopped just as any other authoritarian or uh, nasty approach um, has to be stopped. So that, of course, leads you to a conflict, but conflicts cross borders. And at the same time, the world order is so dependent upon the definition of borders. So I think there is a big debate going on. You've got a clear identity of what needs to happen under the UN's SDGs. That's a, a very good recipe. It's a bit all-encompassing. So some of them are catastrophic if they are not done. Some of them are simply desirable. Uh, it is important uh, to have hope generally means they need to be able to live in a secure uh, way in terms of who they are, who they are with in terms of family and community, and have the opportunity to increase their well-being in life. And that includes economic opportunity as well. So, you know, the idea of a non-growth approach is quite difficult to sustain in terms of whether you get democracies supported and the, the accountabilities and transparency that should go with that. So put all that together, uh, I think there may be a, an increasing recognition that we, uh, we need to be more prepared to look at, if you like, the um, preventative against catastrophe risk in a collective way in order to have greater chance to move positively forwards. The, the challenge to that is that I, I suspect that uh, a lot of people will be very, very expert and will have a lot of opinions that will drive policy about, frankly, fighting the last war. So I think we will end up probably going very well down the route of how we would have responded better to the coronavirus, COVID-19. Although I have to say, I think that uh, broadly, um, uh, there are too many armchair critics. I think most governments have acted pretty well so far. Uh, it's a very, very difficult thing to marry the science with human behaviours in accountable democracies. And I think br broadly, so far, it's um, uh, the right decisions have been taken. But that said, it won't stop people wanting to say it should never have happened. It could have all been so much better with the benefit of hindsight. And they will no doubt think about how you put in place, whether that amounts to effectively insurance policy and all the expenditures that go with that. I don't know. The, the problem is looking at the fan graph of potential future risk, whether that's pandemic, whether it is to do with climate change resource uh, shifting and uh, reductions, whether it's to do with, with um, cyber war, whether it's to do with, you know, all these are massive risks. Uh, my, my own personal view is that I think the thing that's going to be a greatest challenge going forward to a global population that may well top 10 billion uh, is going to be drinking water shortage. Uh, 
And if you do have a rise in sea level, I see about 42% of coastal cities finding all of their water systems are in, uh, in, infused with saline seawater and will become uh, very challenging. And the, there isn't enough um, desalination plant in the world that could possibly meet that. So I do see water as becoming the scarce resource, which uh, could lead to some very uh, unsettling. Uh, will we have a better collective view going forward? Maybe. It has tended to take world crises to produce the next step, the First World War, the sadly uh, ill-fated League of Nations. Once America was persuaded to join a United Nations after the Second World War, uh, thank God, the Third World War. Uh, some would argue that was somewhat supported by mutually assured destruction as well with nuclear weapons. But all that said, the U.S. going to serve that purpose. But is it going to be the one that's best configured as a senior diplomatic body controlled by its member states with all those interests of the states basically competing rather than coming to a common fiduciary view of the globe? Are they going to be the best configuration going forward? Or do we need some form of, uh, it may be impossible, but some form of trust about the planet which is then usefully using experts and the one thing about the coronavirus which i think has been uh, a, a good step forward is there had been an increasing distrust between political decision makers and leaders and, and experts and i think now um, the recognition that the science and the facts has to drive policy is a proper uh, writing of the ship and uh, and I'm glad to see that. Um, well, thank you. That's very interesting. And, and uh, lastly, um, Stephen, uh, you've obviously held um, a number of portfolios that play into this whole discussion. Um, you've had industry portfolios. You've had international development portfolios. You've been at the UN. Uh, we've talked about this in 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 broad scope, but I wondered how do you feel about more cross-sector involvement from a multiplicity of industries but particularly because this is our constituency um, what you feel about adding an aerospace and defense sector component in that and what i mean by that i guess is aerospace and defense as we've touched upon in this interview has a great skill set to offer and technology of course too but it also has this sort of overarching um, systems of systems engineering skill set as well. It sees things, the world even, as systems. And it strikes me and it strikes all of us, my colleagues whom I work with, that a systems approach to global challenges may have been lacking hitherto, even if it's a desirable outcome. Um, so what do you think of this sort of greater cross-sectoral approach to the challenges with aerospace and defence sector skill sets in its mix? Well, at a personal level, speaking for myself, I have absolutely no issue whatever. I think the more collaboration and the more openness between all sectors bearing upon issues of common, uh, common shared experience uh, towards a common good is, is fantastic. Of course, there is a big question about what resources underpin that? Are they basically public resources or are they private shareholder sourced resources? If they're private shareholder sourced resources, then people need a return. So the question is, how do you marry getting a return out of something which is towards a common public good? Uh, that has always been a perennial issue uh, and one which will no doubt uh, never be solved in one sense. Um, but that said, uh, I certainly have no issue whatever about uh, the aerospace and defence industry being part of a cross-sectoral working. Um, there will always be the, the limitations and the constraints upon making sure that uh, competing companies do not share pricing, customer information, uh, and they will be very jealously guarding their know-how as well as their registered or applied uh, intellectual property um, and and their relationships which is an additional issue because many of the uh, participants in the aerospace and defense sector have a massive reliance upon enduring relationships with public 
institutions, with ministries, with governments, even though the politicians may change, they actually build a relationship uh, with the institution and uh, the actual personnel come and go. So I th think there's a, um, and that is not necessarily replicated across many other sectors who are basically either on the consumer facing side or business to business uh, or on exports or uh, broad uh, application. So I think because the aerospace industry, but more particularly the defense industry, is, is somewhat public sector procured heavy, that does give it a distinction which is more difficult to marry into cross-sectoral working uh, because very often some of their risks are very big risks, big punts, which only really can be taken by the backing, at least the backing anyway, of big public sector financing. So uh, I would be, but it's interesting if you look at something which is completely private sector finance, such as the emergence of I don't know, Microsoft, Bill Gates, uh, a rich man, and he and his wife are wonderful philanthropists. And they, uh, and I, it, one of the organizations I chair, uh, the Innovative Vector Control Consortium, which is looking for the next vector solutions, particularly for malaria, um, is, is very generously funded by the Gates Foundation. So, yeah, that's completely private sector driven. Eventually, of course, governments caught up and needed to be part of being able to procure access. And of course, you know, governments around the world are some of the largest purchasers now of those legacy products of Microsoft, as well as uh, underpinning so many of the things that are um, used by your uh, sector in, in their um, added value uh, manufacturing and processing. So I would be uh, completely in favor of collaboration but I do think that the guardrails and the, uh, if you like, the terms of trade of that collaboration do in a positive way seeking where, where can we achieve common good? Where can we ally ourselves to delivering on these areas of the SDGs where we can have a big effect? Uh, where can we really make this people-centered? Because if it's people-centered, you'll have far more little necessary at governments and policy development. So I think it, so long as it's not seen to be remote industry batting for itself. And one of the things that I learned long before I was actually a politician, but when I was representing the industry that I was uh, part of, um, and I happened to have one of these institutional representative roles in it, and I remember going along to see a Secretary of State at the time, uh, because it mattered in the industry I was in that we had a very active road program because it would use a lot of the quarried aggregates that uh, I happened to be, uh, as part of the business I was helping to run, uh, interested in. And the Secretary of State at the time and said, um, well, when you come back in three months' time, and there's only one of you, and secondly, when you come and tell me how you're going to help here and ask for workload then we can talk and that's the nature of collaboration of a sector is if it is then interacting with government with policy makers with public bodies using taxpayer funding they have to think how they're going to help deliver those policies not you should be giving me more work to do so i can make more money for my shareholders that doesn't get you off first base and when you replicate that across the world the UN in terms of its procurement the question is how can you best help the UN in its responsibilities deliver either life-saving protection or good development in countries whose emerging economies need to be supported in order to be able to have their fair share of hope as much as survival Thank you. And one final subset to that question is, is looking at it through a national prism. In the research that we've done, we've uncovered tens of billions, if not hundreds of billions of dollars across the aerospace and defense sector in audited technology that has yet to be liberated, if you like, towards the global challenges space and arena. Now, um, in order to liberate it, what those companies say is that there needs to be some leverage mechanism. There needs to be something that can actually uh, uh, 
get it to the sort of the surface where it can do some good. I, I wondered what you, I mean, a number have suggested that possi one possible solution here in the UK would be to get DFID to act as a sort of, you know, DFID money to act as a lubricant in that mechanism to get that uh, um, unutilized, buried billion, billions of dollars asset out into the world. Do you think there's more that, that sort of an organization or government, a government organization like DFID could do to act in that capacity uh, with industry here in the UK? Um, I think rather than answer that, with DFID particularly in mind, because DFID has a particular responsibility uh, to use um, so-called ODA money, which is Overseas Development Assistance money, which is defined under the OECD and monitored by what's called the DAC committee. And very specifically, that is for uh, expenditures to relieve extreme poverty around the world. And the UK also has a, a specific law that all aid in that guise should be untied, so that you can't favour UK investment. That can, it will always be a controversial area. I mean, it's something in which I happen to um, believe quite strongly because I think it is the most effective way of utilizing the money for uh, our responsibilities as global citizens to try and create a more secure world, which in the end benefits us all. It's therefore in our own self interest as much as it is in the global interest, and particularly where we need the maximum. Uh, chance of hope and uh, and a lack of sort of having to grab and in a sort of rather Darwinistic way uh, compete for scarce resources as we now face the big climate change challenge uh, for generations to come. So uh, I would I would actually think more in terms of the government as a whole, and uh, to some degree that there is there is already uh, mechanisms and policies which are intended to try and try and do that, uh, whether the, that's the Prosperity uh, Fund and the initiative, which uh, is partly out of the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, of course, in uh, be your national interest in influencing uh, you, others towards your worldview, and in our case, towards democratic settlements, peaceful worlds, and, and growth in economic opportunities for, for all. So I think there is a... Um, there is a challenge because uh, the um, the unlocking of that uh, resource, it, 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 you say unlocked, but it isn't totally liberated when it's unlocked. There is still quite a strong hold because some of it will be technology they're still making money out of elsewhere. So there is a there's a qualitative element to what you describe as liberating this technology in those huge sums you cite. I would, um, I, I would slightly turn it the other way around. Uh, and, and I would say that uh, it would be better if, if the outcomes, if the products or the processes or the personnel, even, if they could be imagined into where they can be of most effect, then start worrying once you've established that's a good strategy to have, to use that in order to create a common good in collaboration with the political will of governments, with the expertise and technical competence of the civil service to make things happen and to be accountable and transparent, as must be, it does happen in places, uh, perhaps more easily it's identified in the logistical sector than it would be in the aerospace and defense sector, but it does happen in those sectors. And, and then, once you have a strategy, then you look to the resource that lies behind it to match delivering that strategy. But if you're looking to think of the resources that have to underpin it, then it's almost like resources looking for an opportunity to go to work. And I think the liberating of that technology should be much more, what purpose could this really deliver in support of the SDGs? And then we should go and look for the resources to make it happen. Brilliant. Well, on that um, note, um, let's conclude. I'm extremely grateful to you for uh, talking to us today. Uh, and um, uh, anyway, I look forward to a future discussion, but I'm very grateful, Stephen. Thank you so much.